Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're almost through module one, so we've only got two more lectures left. Last time we talked about microevolution, evolution within a species. Today we're going to talk about macroevolution, evolution basically between species, speciation. Then on Friday we're going to talk about phylogeny and cladistics, and we'll get into that at the end. But before we do that, some announcements. So so if you have any questions on that, post up in discussion board, let me know. Uh, okay, before we go into today's topic, let's talk about microevolution from last time. So which of these is a good example of microevolution? So I'll let you give you a couple seconds, read through there. All right, so microevolution, slow ch incremental change, gradual incremental changes over time within the same species. A good example of that is herbicide resistant weeds. So over time, a given weed species would become more and more resistant to an herbicide as the herbicide kills the members of that species, that population that are not resistant to the herbicide, they're weeded out of the gene pool. And so over time, that species sort of gradually becomes more and more resistant as those resistant weeds pass on their genes to the next generation. Uh, Homo sapiens versus Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, this is two different species. This is macro evolution. That split between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. That is macro evolution, what we're going to talk about today. The difference between cats and dogs, cats and dogs are two different kinds of mammals. This is also macro evolution. However, if you wanna talk about the differences among dogs or among cats, those are the same species. That is micro evolution we talked about last time. Uh, and then mass extinction events, that's not really an example of evolution at all, uh, but it can lead to evolution. So it can open up new niches uh, lead to rapid changes, lead to speciation, but it's not actually evolution on itself, although I suppose you could call it a macroevolutionary process. Uh, so again, we talked a little bit about how evolution can be sort of controversial, and it's really a lot of kind of blurring the lines between these two and sort of not having a full understanding of the process. So uh, here's a professor, uh, presumably, uh, speaking with a student or a member of the community. Uh, he says, I see evolution happening in my lab. It's a fact. And his little thought bubble here is that he sees butterflies evolving from generation to generation and the gene pool changing and that species slowly changing over time. That is micro evolution. Micro evolution is a fact that's observable. It happens. It happens with bacteria. It happens with weeds. It happens with viruses as we are finding out with COVID. Uh, micro evolution is a definitive fact macroevolution we're going to talk about now is observed in the fossil record because it happens at time scales that are much longer and that's what this person is thinking of is macroevolution speciation changes in species and again they sort of have this misunderstanding of the directionality the progressive nature of evolution which doesn't really exist we we didn't slowly evolve towards this goal form of humans and it didn't happen with these like giant leaps like this. It was a gradual process. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So again, micro, ma micro evolution versus macro evolution, you need to have an understanding of this. So again, micro evolution, the process occurs at a small scale. And so don't be confused, micro doesn't mean microscopic. So it doesn't just happen in microscopic organisms. Again, we've talked about like dogs, microevolution has happened in dogs. Wolves started out as the only dog, and every dog that you've ever seen is a microevolutionary variant on the wolf. Uh, the time scale happens on short ish timeframe. So we've been monkeying with dogs for thousands of years. Uh, that's a relatively short time frame in the time frame of geologic deep time, like we talked about earlier in the semester. And the change occurs in the same species. So even though dogs look very different, they're all capable of interbreeding with each other. They're the same species. And information in the gene is getting kind of rearranged or deleted or altered. Those mutations that we talked about, that's microevolution. 
macro evolution, the process occurs at a large scale. And again, don't get confused by like large organisms. Macro evolution happens in small organisms as well. It's just that this is the process by which new species arise. It's not little modifications to a species. It's an entirely new species has been created. Uh, in the gene pool, there's some new addition or deletion, and it leads to some new development, a new organism that's different enough that it's no longer the same species. So this is the distinction between micro and macro evolution. It has, this is basically changes in the species, and this is changes basically to a new species, speciation, which we'll talk about today. So that was a lot of using of the word species. What is a species? We talked about this vaguely. It's the most specific taxa in the hierarchy. So like our species is Homo sapiens. Sapiens is our species, Homo is our genus that binomen identifies one individual organism, us. So the species is the fundamental level of taxonomic classification. There's only one Homo sapiens. There's only one Canis lupus. Uh, it's the only taxonomic category that's actually real. So remember like kingdom, phylum, class, order, all of those are convenient buckets that we've created to lump organisms in, but they don't have a real natural meaning in nature. Species does. A species is defined as animals of the same species. They recognize each other as the same and they can viably interbreed with each other, viably meaning that their offspring are fertile and able to reproduce. So all of these dogs, as different as they may be, they are the same species because they all say, hey, you're a dog, I'm a dog. They'll bark at each other. Hey, woof, 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 what's going on? Uh, they recognize that they're dogs and they can viably interbreed with each other to make more dogs. Uh, some sort of species, there are these hybrid animals that result from two very closely related species that aren't very evolutionarily distant. Uh, they can still, they're close enough related that they can still reproduce with each other, but the offspring are quote unquote non-viable. They're not fertile. So for example, the one that people are probably most familiar with is if you breed a horse with a donkey, you get a mule. It has sort of the workhorse uh, it has, it's sort of a combination of both animals, but mules are sterile. If you remember all the way back to uh, high school biology, there's the diploid number and the haploid number. Mules do not produce the gametes to reproduce. They cannot reproduce. Mules cannot make more mules. You can only make more mules by horses and donkeys breeding. The mules are sterile. Uh, a very similar thing happens with lions, tigers, and leopards, they're all big cats. They're close enough evolutionarily that they can interbreed with each other, but the offspring are sterile. They're sterile hybrids. Uh, this is a liger uh, made famous in Napoleon Dynamite, bred for their magical powers or their skills in magic or something like that. Uh, just look how big it is. It's kind of like the, the size of the lion and tiger together with the striping of the tiger and kind of the coloration of the lion, that kind of tawny lion color, as opposed to the orange and black of the tiger. Uh, they're these massive animals, but they cannot breed with each other. So they are sterile. Uh, if you go the other way around, the lioness with a tiger, it makes a tigon. And leopards and li uh, li lions can actually breed too and make a, a leopon. So all these cats, they're really neat, they're really cool. Uh, they are not viable, though they're sterile, so they're sterile hybrids, so they're not actually a species because they can't actually continue on. That's kind of the end of the line. When that liger dies, there's no more ligers in that lineage. Uh, so that leads us to the species concept. Uh, so divining a species can be very difficult from the fossils. So again, the biological species concept is that species are recognized by their ability to interbreed with each other. And that's all well and good for like dogs. We can see if dogs are similarly enough to each other that they can interbreed. We can see that 
okay, well, tigers can breed with tigers, but if they breed with lions, it's not viable. And so that's a different species, even though they look very similar to each other, especially if we're only looking at the hard parts. Uh, think about if you're looking at a tiger skeleton versus a lion skeleton without the difference in coloration, without the difference in fur color, without the difference in pattern, they probably look really close to each other. Now, obviously there are differences. Those differences are pretty small. Uh, and so if we were just based on the hard parts, we'd have to go with morphological differences where species are clustered by recognizable physical traits. In most cases, if we're dealing with the fossil record, we're talking about recognizable physical traits that are recognizable with just the skeleton, just the fossilized hard parts, we don't have the luxury of being able to look at similarities in the soft parts. We don't have the luxury of looking at similarities in coloration and fur pattern and, and things like that. We can't do it. It's not preserved in the fossil record. Or if it is, it's very rare. Only the exceptional kind of Lagerstaten pres preservation that we sometimes see. So uh, this can lead to some mistakes in defining things as a species. So for, this is an old study um, from a dinosaur group where they actually grouped it by skull morphology. They said, okay, this is the quote unquote normal skull. These are one species. These here have a flatter skull from measurement and these kind of have like a longer skull and the more elongate skull. Uh, what it turned out is that this wasn't three different species, it was that the skulls were crushed and preserved in different directions. And so it was the same species and it was a function of how the fossil was preserved, how much the fossil was distorted as it was buried and fossilized. And so again, the fossil record is really difficult to tease out these levels and it can lead to mistakes. Uh, but let's talk about how species arise. So how do you get a new species or speciation. Speciation is the creation of a new species. So speciation is defined by when the genetic differences are sufficient enough that the organisms can no longer viably interbreed. So lions and tigers are separate species from each other. They're now different enough that their genetics prevent them from viably interbreeding. Uh, so how do we get to that situation? Well, there's two main factors here. One is the gene pool, which is all of the genes within a population that expresses all of the variation within that population. So here is a population of frogs, and they have different genetic expressions for color. There's a lot of green frogs. There's some purple frogs and rare red frogs. That's the whole gene pool. Within the gene pool, the gene for green is very prominent. The gene for red is not. Uh, and then there's the idea of gene flow. So gene flow is where a gene pool is mixed and modified by interaction with other adjacent populations. So this is this population of frogs. If there was another population of frogs, uh, that was kind of the next pond over or something like that, that might have a different gene pool. And if they're intermingling with each other and frogs are easily able to go from one pond to another, eventually that gene pool is gonna kind of homogenize and kind of balance out and equilibrate. Uh, we see evidence for this in human evolution. Again, Homo sapiens, us, Homo neanderthalensis, not us, Neanderthals, uh, there's evidence that there was interbreeding and crossbreeding and sharing of genetic information between the populations. And it actually uh, impacted who we are today. So like if you do an ancestry.com or something like that, they'll actually tell you what percent Neanderthal you are. And uh, generally it's like one-ish to two-ish percent. Two is high, but we are carrying around the genes from these other uh, homo species due to uh, intermingling of our gene pools. Um, so how do we get these changes in the gene pool enough where it is a new species? So how do we diverge enough? So converge means come together, diverge means go, to, go apart. How do we get to the point where 
the gene pools are sufficiently diverged from each other, sufficiently different from each other, where we start favoring speciation. So for a novel, a new gene to be introduced into the gene pool and be retained in the gene pool, there's two things, one of two things, one of these two things has to happen. So either the gene pool is very small so that any newly emerged trait is not overwhelmed. So thinking back to that frog example there, how many frogs were there? It was like maybe a dozen. There was one red frog. One out of 12 is not bad. That, that gene is still represented in the population enough that it may end up being passed on. Of course, if that red frog dies before it passes on its genes, that would be the end of the line probably. Um, but if there is 10, 12,000 frogs and there's only one, one, one carrying that gene for the red phenotype, uh, then it's a lot less likely that that gene is going to be transported or put out towards the next generation and eventually become significant in the gene pool. It's just there's so many more of the other genes that it's going to be watered down and diluted out. Uh, another thing is that the gene flow is low so that if there are no new gene traits coming in, any newly emerged trait in the gene pool is more likely, or I should say less likely, to be diluted out over time. So again, here's a population here of some birds, uh, relatively small population here. There's five birds. Uh, if one of these blue birds transfers over to this, um, there's a very small gene pool. And so that blue gene is more likely to kind of hang around. If there is a lot of moving back and forth, gene flow back and forth, then eventually there's going to be like a winner or loser here. Either their birds are going to gradually move towards blue or kind of gradually move towards red. Uh, the, in, the speciation kind of relies on this barrier being sufficient so that there's not a lot of flow back and forth and that the gene can kind of stay in the gene pool without being diluted out. Um, there's also an influence of random events. So like, for example, uh, we've been talking about natural selection, survival of the fittest, again, try not to think of it that way, but it's a common phrase. Um, over geologic time, there have been these geologic catastrophes, like primarily the extinction of dinosaurs through the asteroid impact or large volcanic eruptions. Or even, so we talked about isolation being an important factor in speciation. One thing we see very often is different species arising as things are isolated on different islands. Let's say these islands are volcanic and one of them has a large eruption and all of the organisms on that island are, are destroyed. Uh, those organisms weren't any less fit for the environment. They were perfectly suited to that environment, it's just that their environment happened to disappear overnight, catastrophically. Uh, that can actually have an effect on gene pool as well. So uh, here is some bugs. Uh, they're currently in a five to five ratio. The gene pool is well balanced. Red and blue are equally represented, equally likely to be passed on next generation. There doesn't seem to be any natural selection favoring one or the other. It seems like it's just as good to be blue as it is red. Now there is just happenstance. Something falls out of the sky and crushes these four blues. Why four blues? Just because they happened to be in this place. Those That blue has been removed from the gene pool. And now we have a ratio of five to one in the gene pool. What's likely to happen in future generations? Well, if we take the next generation, the next generation is likely to be 10 to 2, red to blue. And so over time, that population is probably going to be increasingly red. The blue gene was just happened to be randomly kind of filtered out by this natural disaster. And so we've kind of seen these evolutionary bottlenecks that in some cases are just due to random chaotic chance of natural events happening or not happening in given places at given times. So it's kind of interesting to think about the consequences of that. Um, but again, uh, most of the speciation 
is the result of some kind of isolation. So again, to have a speciation, to have the gene pool split into two different groups, uh, you need either a small gene pool or low gene flow. The best way to do this is with small isolated populations. So how do we do this? Um, the most common way is called allopatric speciation. The, and then as we go this way on the chart, it sort of becomes less and less common because what we'll see is that from left to right here, allopatric is the most isolated. There's actually a barrier that separates these organisms and doesn't allow gene flow across or allows a very limited gene flow across. So think about this like two different islands. There's part of the gene pool is isolated on this island, part of the gene pool is isolated on this island, and there's very little mixing back and forth because there's a physical barrier, the water between them, or a mountain range between them, some physical barrier. Uh, Parapatric is similar, except instead of like a physical barrier, they're utilizing, they're exploiting a new niche. They're doing a different thing. That's kind of the way that the finches developed is, uh, so those beaks of finches, finch, some finches started exploiting the heavy nuts and developed the big crushing beaks. And some went for the insects and developed kind of the little skinnier plucking beaks. Some went for the smaller seeds, again, the more delicate beaks, because they were filling different niches. Uh, they were all still intermingling with each other, but they were trying to fill a different niche. Uh, Parapatric is similar, except the niche is not isolated. It's close by, and so there is still gene flow kind of back and forth, makes it difficult for speciation to occur because it's very hard. The isolation is pretty low. And then sympatric, uh, there's just a genetic polymorphism. There's two different types of gene pool there, kind of within the same area, and there's not really a hard barrier. It's very difficult for speciation to occur here. So the more isolated the populations are, the more likely it is that they have low flow, low transfer back and forth, and the more likely it is that over time they gradually lean towards a different direction than the other population. So let's talk about allopatric since it's the most common and it's kind of the easiest to understand. So somehow the population becomes isolated by a geographic or environmental barrier. One way this happens is with plate tectonics. The plates are moving. The one continent goes one way, the other continent goes the other way. What once was a consistent whole population has now been isolated into the population on this continent and the population remaining on this continent. And there's very little flow back and forth or a mountain range forms through tectonic processes. Um, so for example, uh, the alpine chipmunk and the lodgepole chipmunk, uh, they were at one point the same species. Uh, their historical ranges sort of overlapped. Um, but over time with climate, uh, the alpine chipmunks were sort of forced to higher and higher elevations. And so they become more and more isolated from the population as they have to stay in the higher elevations. And uh, the lodgepole chipmunk is able to like kind of move back and forth a little bit easier. And so it probably won't adjust to the different environment. Uh, that was probably kind of confusing. I don't think I explained that very well. Um, so let's look at a modern example. Um, so this is a really good video that kind of shows this in action. It's about 10 minutes long, so I'm not going to play it here, but uh, the Congo River it happens to have a really high diversity of different fish species. And one question is why? Like what's so special about the Congo River that all these different fish species would originate? Uh, we think of a river, a river is a solid run of water, should be kind of fully connected, should be kind of one population, one common gene pool. Uh, it should be really difficult for speciation to occur. Uh, but what we see on the Congo River is that the geology, 
There's a lot of these deep spots, a lot of different areas of hydro, uh, hydrology, different flow patterns in the river that keep this population sort of separate from each other. Rapids act as sort of barriers. Deep places in the river bottom act as physical barriers. And so the populations over time isolate from each other and they gradually diverge towards genes that favor that particular part of the environment. And so this is a modern example of geology and hydrology affecting biology. Again, these processes are all sort of linked and we'll talk about that later on in the course, but it's a really good example and I encourage you to watch the video. Um, so, oops, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, there we go. Uh, so again, like once this population sort of splits, once you have that isolation or trying to go to that different niche, the parapatric, isolation versus allopatric, which is actually a physical barrier, the organisms in that population, certain traits are going to be favored over others in certain environments or in certain niches. And so again, the organisms diverge, their gene pools diverge, become more and more different as they fill these separate niches. One reason they do this is to avoid direct competition. Uh, if all of the finches were trying to go for the same food source, that's a very limited resource and there's a lot of competition, a lot of fighting, and there's going to be winners and losers. If the finches are able to diversify and fill different niches, they're like, okay, well, you guys are eating the ground seeds, I'm going to eat the insects. Over time, their beaks will be favored to exploit that insect resource or that ground nut resource and they'll actually diverge and adapt to the niche that they're filling or adapt to the environment and the location that they're filling. So this is probably the best example here, the different beak styles, um, but there's also some others. So there's Bergman's rule. Uh, again, certain physical traits are favored in certain environments. So one of these rules is that animals that live in colder climates tend to be larger. So think about polar bears. Polar bears are the largest species of bear because they live in a cold environment. Cold environments favor larger organisms. Sun bears live in the tropics and they're relatively small. Still a pretty big bear, but they're relatively small compared to polar bears. Uh, think the same thing kind of happens. So like the, the Irish elk, this massive now extinct Elk lived in very cold climates, very large. Uh, the moose, moose are very massive versus deer or antelope that live in warmer environments. So why? Well, animals in colder climates are trying to decrease their surface area relative to their volume. So a polar bear's surface area compared to the whole mass of the bear they're a big bear, uh, their skin is less of the, the volume, the surface. So organisms lose heat from their surface. Uh, that's why like we always like put a hat on and you go outside, you lose a lot of heat through your head. If your head is large compared to your body, uh, more of the mass is internal and you lose less heat. And so organisms tend to get bigger for colder environments. That's not the only reason that organisms get bigger. We'll talk about that in the context of dinosaurs later on, but it's one thing. If an organism is originally living in kind of temperate and there's a split where some start moving north to colder climates, some start moving south towards warmer climates, you're gonna start seeing these shapes and sizes be favored. And eventually you might see a split in a different species. Uh, another thing that tends to happen in warmer climates is that in warmer climates, animals tend to have longer limbs and longer, bigger appendages. Uh, they sort of have the opposite problem of those colder animals. They're trying to get rid of heat, not save it. So like a jackrabbit's ears are very large. You see there's a lot of veins in the ears. They're trying to get rid of heat. Their ears are like big radiators. 
their legs are long and spindly, they're trying to increase their surface area relative to their mass. They're trying to get rid of heat. The fennec fox is another good example. These big old radar ears, these cute fuzzy ears. They also have the fluffy toes so that they can walk on hot sand without burning themselves. Uh, so again, this is a way that animals sort of diverge towards their environments. If you think about a snowshoe hare, a rabbit that's developed towards a northern cold climate, snowshoe hares are plump and compact. They have short ears and they have a white coloration on their fur, at least in the winter time, to blend in with their surroundings. And so this is how just ending up in a particular geographic place, ending up in an environment that's different from where you came from and being isolated there over time, natural selection is going to favor the organisms that have advantages. So like the first jackrabbit that kind of moved into a desert environment didn't already have the gigantic ears. The ones that had larger ears were more likely to survive. They were more fit for that environment. And so over time, the gene for large ears was more and more and more favored. And gradually they became more and more until they were so different, the genes were so favored towards those large ears that now if a jackrabbit and a snowshoe hare came close to each other, they're now a different species. One has adapted so much genetically to the cold environment and one has adapted so much to the warm environment, the hot environment, that if they ever meet in the middle in the warm environment, they're not going to recognize each other as the same, and they're not going to be able to successfully interbreed with each other because they're not the same species anymore. They've diverged from each other. Uh, this is a video that does a really good job of kind of in a very simplified manner of showing how a population that was linked together, uh, there's a very dramatic moment in the video where the continents sort of separate and they're stuck on one side or the other, um, but they all kind of start out the same, where the population is whole, the population is gene flows very easy back and forth, there's no barrier, and then it splits apart. There's allopatric isolation, and one continent sort of drifts towards cold environments, one continent drifts towards warm environments, and you see over time that this population slowly adapts to the warmer climates with morphologies that favor the warmer environment. And this species or this group, this population, slowly drifts towards the, pop, the morphologies, the characteristics that favor the colder environments. And eventually when they meet up at the end, they no longer recognize each other as the same. They're different enough now that they're different species. They've genetically diverged enough that they're not able to successfully, viably reproduce with each other anymore. They have speciated. They are a different species. And they look different, and they act different, and they are different because of the different environments in which they evolved, in which natural selection favored the traits that were advantageous for that environment. And it tended to filter out the traits that were not. Uh, so it's a really good example, uh, kind of oversimplified, but it, it's, 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 it's a nice example. Um, so again, it's pretty hard to define what a species is. Uh, in the modern day, we have the advantage of we can go look and see, like, can lions successfully interbreed with tigers? And the answer is no. And so we can say, okay, those are different species. We don't have the luxury when we're dealing with the fossil record of saying like, okay, are these organisms different enough that they could interbreed or, or not? Are the, is the different species biologically? So again, we're forced to look at, is this a different species morphologically? Is this thing a different enough shape, a different enough size, different enough anatomy that it is a different species. It's a different creature. They wouldn't recognize each other as the same thing. They would not interbreed with each other successfully. That's really tough to tell just from the skeletal remains. So one kind of famous oops 
uh, or at least we think it's noops, it's actually still a little bit controversial. Uh, Nano Tyrannus was described in the fossil record as a small Tyrannosaurid cousin, a relative of the Tyrannosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex. And so this is an artist rendition here of a larger T-Rex uh, scavenging a Triceratops corpse with a little bit of competition from a smaller dinosaur, but also some competition from this smaller Tyrannosaur, the Nano Tyrannus. Uh, at the time, it was thought these are different species, thought to be a smaller cousin, kind of very similar. Here's the skeletal diagrams of both you can see that they're pretty close, pretty really close. Uh, but uh, now the science is kind of leaning more towards that Nano Tyrannus isn't actually a different species of Tyrannosaurus rex or Tyrannosaur. Uh, it's just a juvenile stage. So it's not a small species of Tyrannosaur. It's a juvenile T-Rex. It's a teenager. It's still developing. It's still changing. Uh, and the, the skeletons are different enough that we might be misled into thinking it's a different species. Uh, how is that possible? Well, just think about humans for a second. Uh, think about if we saw nothing about the soft parts that we have, and think about if we were not able to witness constantly the development of a human from a baby to an adult. Think if we didn't have the luxury of being able to see that happen. If you have a baby, the skeleton of a baby, don't want to really think about that, but whatever, um, the morphology of an infant human is very different from the morphology of an adult human. The ratios are all wrong. The head is gigantic compared to the body. The limbs are a little bit stubby compared to the body. Uh, the certain bone plates are not fused yet. The teeth are different. There are no teeth initially. There's things that are very, very different about a juvenile developing human than an adult human, and size is just one of them. If we were looking at just the fossil record, just the bones of humans, 100,000 years, a million years in the future, some alien species lands here and starts looking at us, are they going to recognize that infant humans or juvenile humans even teenage humans are the same as adult humans, the same species, because they change dramatically over time. Another thing is that there's sexual dimorphism in humans, male humans and female humans, although we share a lot of similarities, there are anatomical physical differences between us, maybe enough that you would look at a male skeleton and a female skeleton and be like, okay, these are very closely related to each other but they're clearly a different species. The hips are very different in this organism than in this organism. The size is different in this organism on average than it is in this organism. They're clearly two different species. Uh, sexual dimorphism is another thing. Is this particular tyrannosaurid specimen and this other tyrannosaurid specimen, are they actually different species or is one just a male and one's a female? Is one a juvenile and one's an adult? It's very difficult to tease out these differences. And so this is a complication when we're looking at the fossil record. Is this actually a new species or are we kind of misinterpreting it? And of course, we won't have the luxury of a time machine to go back and look. Uh, we won't have genetic material, at least not with current technology. Uh, we'll never know if we're right or not. Uh, again, we favor the simplest solution is probably the best. Uh, but yeah, this is an example of a, a mistake, and well, a likely mistake. It's there's still an active, controversial argument that rages about this: is Nano Tyrannus just a baby Tyrannosaurus, or is it something totally different? Uh, so again, we see sort of the complications. We see that dinosaurs split into different groups. Again, this speciation, this splitting into different species is due to their environment or their geography. And what we see from the fossil record is that dinosaur species do split over time and also over space. So this is one thing that a lot of people sort of have a misconception about is that 
not all dinosaurs existed at the same time. So if we look at the entire duration of the Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs, we're talking about 150-ish million years. Tyrannosaurus lived for like two to three million of those years, a relatively short window. Stegosaurus lived long before that, separated by tens of millions of years. There's actually, again, more time between Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus than there is between Tyrannosaurus and us. There's only 66 million years between us and T-Rex. There's something like 80 or 90 million years between T-Rex and Stegosaurus. Not all dinosaurs lived at the same time. And not all dinosaurs lived at the same place. So Stegosaurus and T-Rex never overlapped in time. They're separated by tens of millions of years. Uh, there's also a lot of different dinosaurs that although they existed at the same time, they didn't exist in the same place. So think about like modern animals, like lions, tigers, and bears. They occupy different niches in different continents. They don't overlap with each other, even though they're living at the same time. Uh, what we see with like Tyrannosaurus, for example, Tyrannosaurs are the large apex carnivores of their environment. And what we see is that there's really only a handful of them that exist at the same time. And generally there's only one of them or maybe two that exist in the same place at the same time. There's not enough resources to support multiple species of the apex predator. There's only one. Think about the African savanna there's only one really true apex predator, the lion, and then there's some smaller, the hyena, things like that, but the lions are the dominant apex predator. There's not enough resources to support more than that. They fill that niche and they outcompete others that might try to fill that niche. And so like this happens with dinosaurs as well. So uh, in, the, in this particular point in time here, Asia is a continent, there's the Loramides of Western North America. There's this big seaway in between that keeps them isolated. There's Eastern North America, Appalachia, and there's Europe. Pangaea has split apart during the Mesozoic and now there's four distinct geographic regions that cannot mingle, at least not for terrestrial organisms. And so different, so at the time of Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus is dominant in the Western regions of North America. At the same time, there was a different Tyrannosaurid that was very closely related, very close in morphology, filling a very similar niche, a very similar role in Eastern North America. Uh, another, one, another one living at the same time in a different place, again, filling the same role, looking very similar doing very similar things, not competing directly with Tyrannosaurus rex though, because Tyrannosaurus rex lives in Western North America. It doesn't live in Asia. Dinosaurs are separated from each other in time and space as well. And we lump these dinosaurs together into these clads. We generate clads. So again, speciation, uh, we often think of speciation, this is kind of that march of progress view where over time there's the ancestral form, over it gradually adds different changes, slowly changes into something else, slowly changes into something else. And at the end, we get this new species uh, without actually branching, without actually splitting. Uh, this is much more common where there's an ancestral form, a common ancestor, and then it moves off into two different environments or two different niches two different continents, two different places where those populations become isolated from each other and they split into two different groups and we get two different clads, two different lumps, two different buckets, two different bins of this organism. This is a lot more common. We're gonna be talking about this and we'll talk more about clad cladistics and phylogeny uh, next class period. But just remember that we're going to be talking more, a lot more about branching than we are about kind of this ever-changing March spectrum of change because generally macro evolution doesn't happen that way. Usually there is a splitting because there's an isolation, there's a geographic separation, but there's some kind of genetic isolation 
between these populations that allows them to develop differently in a different place or a different time or a different niche. Uh, so that's all we have time for today. Hopefully you're still enjoying the lectures. Hopefully you're sticking with me. Again, check out the discussion board, check out the, 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 the study topics. That's all we got for today and goodbye. <laughs>